Hello, my name is Jeffrey Nicholas. I'm a professor of philosophy at Providence College. This is a five-part lecture series on Jared Diamond's Guns, Germs, and Steel. The five-part lecture series has four main parts with uh, two, one part having two subparts. Uh, I've already covered in lecture one, uh, Yali's question, which is why did Europeans come to conquer the rest of the world? It's broadly speaking. Uh, lecture two uh, discussed uh, the uh, human development of society from Eden to Cajamarca, where the Spanish uh, overcame the uh, Incan emperor. This is uh, lecture three, part A, in which we will be discussing fruit pro food production. And then in our final lecture, we will talk about uh, moving from luck to germs and steel. So to begin our discussion of food production, uh, Diamond's main argument is that food production arose in the Fertile Crescent because of the plethora of plant and animal species available there, and indigenous crops from different parts of the globe were not equally productive. So as we saw uh, at the beginning of our lectures, uh, Diamond's argument is that it was the luck of uh, available food sources uh, basically geography as an ultimate cause that led to the proximate causes of guns, germs, and steel. So we're getting into this main argument uh, in this lecture, uh, lecture three, part A, uh, looking at the places where food developed. So some common misconceptions of food production. Uh, one is that uh, it was discovered or invented, uh, that someone, uh, some caveman, uh, Adam or Eve uh, came up with uh, producing food, uh, but in fact what history shows is that there was a series of unconscious steps that led to uh, food production. Most likely migration patterns uh, led to people stopping in the same areas and using uh, a same uh, uh, patch of grassland uh, for uh, waste removal and that led to uh, fertile land uh, where seeds were already there to grow the kinds of foods that human beings liked. Also, there is a misconception that uh, there's a sharp divide between hunter-gatherers and food producers. Uh, in our uh, first lecture, we talked about the Maori and the Moriori and how the uh, Moriori uh, returned from a food-producing culture to a hunter-gatherer culture and the reasons there. And so part of Diamond's argument is that there's no sharp divide here and there's no sharp switch. Uh, people gradually develop into uh, food producers from being hunter-gatherers. Uh, and finally, there is an argument that uh, food producers are active managers and hunter-gatherers are passive. Uh, and what we see historically and culturally is that hunter-gatherers are actually uh, active managers of their environment as well. Now, some interesting things that the uh, common uh, that we might not commonly know is that uh, plants are, uh, while various, uh, we tend to eat from a few main food sources. Uh, Diamond says it's typically about a few dozen. So cereals, uh, pulses like soybeans, roots and tubers like uh, potatoes and manioc, uh, sugars and bananas. Uh, now, it's important to keep that in mind because when we study people, uh, which is what ethnobiology, ethnobiology does, uh, that is the study of people's knowledge of the wild plants and animals in their environment, we realize that hunter-gatherers are walking encyclopedias of, uh, of their world uh, with individual names for as many as a thousand plants. So even though we might only be eating a few dozen regularly, uh, there are thousands of plants which the hunter-gatherer knows, and the question becomes, why were they or why were they not able to exploit that knowledge uh, to domesticate the food that they knew about? What we see historically is that food production arose in uh, four primary areas. Uh, Southeast Asia near the, uh, uh, the Fertile Crescent, in China a little later, uh, both, so both around uh, 10,000 years ago, 
uh, in the Andes of South America around 4000 BC, uh, and then in the eastern, uh, presently United States around 2500 uh, BC. Uh, there we have a picture of uh, today's corn uh, and its evolution from uh, Tyrioic, uh, which was the original uh, corn uh, found uh, in the Americas. So what we see then, if we think about these different areas in which uh, food production arise, is that there's a great uh, distinction in these places about the foods available. So this first, first map here is uh, domestic animals primarily, and we'll look at crops in just a minute, but you'll see most of the domesticable animals are in Eurasia with only a few uh, in North and South America. Uh, and some of these, uh, the animals available in North and South America simply aren't uh, domesticable. Uh, they're too, uh, they're, they're not capable of being domesticated for, because of their temper or because of the food sources that they need, et cetera, et cetera. So the buffalo were not able to be domesticated in the same way that the ancestor to the cow was. So you see a plethora of animals that led to domestication uh, for a variety of reasons, whether it was for food or for plowing or for travel uh, that were not present in uh, the Americas. And when we look at food, uh, we see that uh, this is also unevenly distributed. So North America has a variety of food options, artichokes, blueberries, cranberries, sunflowers, uh, the tepary bean and tobacco. Uh, these are not high sources of protein or high sources of uh, calories. Um, and then uh, in the Mediterranean area, we have barley, cattle, celery, dates, garlic, goat, grapes, lentils, lettuce, olives. These are high sources of protein and high sources of calories. And of course, uh, these animals make it easy uh, to farm larger areas of land uh, because they help with plowing. Goats and cattle provide milk uh, that other animals, uh, well, animals in America were not present to provide. So another source of protein. Uh, so we see an uneven array of food sources uh, between Eurasia and North and South America and uh, the middle of Africa. And what's important here is the layout. If you look at the Eurasian continents, you see that they're, uh, despite differences in elevation because of uh, mountain ranges, uh, etc., there is a, a general east-west uh, movement here, which allows uh, seeds to, uh, to migrate easily uh, and grow and develop. Whereas if you look at the Americas and Africa, you see that it's a north uh, south uh, layout that makes it much more difficult for uh, foods to uh, expand. So for instance, I lived in Oregon uh, for a number of years and the soil was never warm enough to grow, grow sweet potatoes, which is an important food source. Uh, and it was even difficult to grow uh, peppers uh, in the cold climate of Oregon, which is not really that cold, but the soil just did not heat up enough for the uh, uh, for that food. The same thing we can say about uh, New England, the soil doesn't get uh, warm enough for things like sweet potatoes to grow. So it's much more difficult to take some of these uh, food sources that we see in Mesoamerica and make them travel north or south, uh, aside from the fact that they have to get over these mountainous regions in this area, in this area, uh, so they uh, that becomes even more problematic because we don't have uh, animal transportation, which will allow that migration to carry large numbers of seeds. Whereas in Eurasia, if you have grapes and lentils develop in the Mediterranean area, it's easy for those to be transported over to uh, India and to Southeast Asia uh, for growth there because it will have a similar kind of climate. 
So the advantages of the Fertile Crescent is that it's within this Mediterranean climate zone where there are mild wet winters and long hot dry summers, a great growing season so food can grow uh, and we can grow more food. Uh, mo many of the ancestors of uh, the crops there are abundant and highly productive. You don't see that in other parts of the world. Uh, and it includes a large percentage of hermaphrodite self starters so that uh, it doesn't need human uh, care in order for it to develop. Uh, the Fertile Crescent then has five advantages over other Mediterranean areas like uh, Southern California. So the Fertile Crescent is the largest area with this climate. Okay, It also has the greatest climatic variation uh, in, that, uh, in that zone uh, so that plants can develop within a certain uh, zone uh, differences within that zone to migrate. Uh, there is a wide range of altitudes and typographies for that development. Uh, just the wealth and ancestors of valuable crops in the Fertile Crescent that you don't see in other areas. And finally, there's less competition in that area uh, from hunter-gatherer lifestyles than in other areas. Uh, so the advantages of these ancestor crops is you have an edible and a uh, crop that is, produces high yields is easily grown. Uh, and that's going to be important, right? Because people have to leave their uh, comfortable uh, migration pattern to grow this food, to settle down and trust that that food is going to be there the next year. Uh, it is harvested quickly and readily stored. So cereals are readily stored. Uh, much of this crop is self-pollinating. Uh, and uh, the ancestor crops uh, needed very little genetic change. So if we go back to that original picture uh, of the corn, there's a huge change here uh, to get to one ear of corn uh, that we would uh, require for uh, food sustenance today. Uh, and finally, the fruit and nut trees that are, are available in that area require a settled life, uh, not only for cultivation, but in order to reap the benefit of the fruit and nuts available there. Okay, this is part one of lecture three, uh, or I should say part A is what I've been calling it, or lecture three. We're going to return uh, in part B of lecture three to the uh, link between these advantages and the growth, growth of dense populations.